In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Trinity on this beautiful 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Warm up our fingers here. If you walk by the uh, Grove Street Cemetery, which is just a couple blocks away from where we are uh, seated, there's a giant carving over the entrance to that famous New Haven Cemetery, which says, the dead shall be raised. The dead shall be raised. It's a beautiful sign of the hope that Christians have and confess every Sunday. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Resurrection is what happened to Jesus on Easter morning, that in his really dead body with wounds and all, he became really alive forever. And that's what Christians believe will one day happen to our bodies, that these bodies that we have right now will go from being dead to being gloriously alive. But let's be honest, bodies being raised, dead bodies being restored to eternal life, it sounds a little crazy, a little naive. Evidently, if you take the tour at the Grove Street Cemetery, they tell you, yes, it's true, the dead shall be raised, but only when Yale decides to build something on top of the graveyard. So that's what the world tends to think of the resurrection, something to laugh at. Today, Jesus is caught up in a debate with the Sadducees who also believed that the dead will only be raised when somebody digs them up. The Sadducees were a group, a denomination in ancient Judaism. And unlike in our enlightened modern times, religious people in the olden days often fought about all sorts of little differences and divided themselves up into competing groups, each thinking that they alone were right. And the Sadducee denomination believed that when you're dead, you're dead, period. Now, it helped that the Sadducees were sort of the richest and highest class of Jews. And when you have everything you want in this life, when you've got an endless credit card limit and prime rib for dinner every night, you tend not to worry too much about life everlasting. Just not a priority. You could probably say the same thing about a lot of folks today. When we have everything that we need in this life, when you're fat and happy and content here and now, who wants or needs eternal life anyway? And so to embarrass Jesus today, the Sadducees ask an embarrassing theoretical question. They ask about an imaginary woman married seven different times to seven different husbands all of whom are brothers. Well, if you, Jesus, are so, so smart and believe in the resurrection and the life everlasting, they want to know, which one of the seven husbands will she end up married to in the resurrection? Of course, as somebody remarked, if this poor woman had to deal with seven different husbands here on earth, maybe the last thing she'd want in heaven is to be married to anybody. It's a foolish question just designed to humiliate Jesus. There's something in this world that cannot stand the idea of the resurrection. Because resurrection means that these bodies matter. Hmm? That our bodies are not just a temporary wrapper for the soul. That they're far more than just meat and bones. But our bodies, your body, bears the image of God. And so are made for an eternity with God. So what we do in these bodies and with these bodies and how we treat all bodies in this life matters eternally. The world tries to have its way with these bodies. It gives us eating disorders. It tells us what an attractive body has to look like. It lets some poor bodies starve. It lets some bodies be shot in the streets of our city. It disposes of old, vulnerable bodies or young, vulnerable bodies or handicapped bodies like they were trash. This world says your body doesn't belong to you, but when it's done, you're done. But the Christian faith says, "Uh -uh." uh-uh. We say, "Uh uh-uh. You are your body. And so it and so you and every body around you in faith will be raised up at the last, to live forever in the resurrection. It's amazing that 
We're not just headed for heaven. Heaven is too small a goal, but for new, endless life in these beautiful bodies. Jesus describes what the life of the resurrection is life. Like, he says, those who are considered worthy of a place in that age neither marry nor are given in marriage. They cannot die anymore because they are like angels. They are children of God. In the resurrection, what's been done to our bodies, the griefs that we've suffered in them, will no longer have the last word. But we will know each other there, though, in a different kind of intimacy. We will hold each other there, but in a new joy and freedom that comes from death having no more power. We will be like angels. We will fully be children of God, newborn children of the resurrection. Somebody once said our imagining the resurrection is like babies in the womb, imagining what the outside world must be like. They hear things, they know things, they feel things, but which of us before our birth could imagine all of this? Or maybe, I don't know, like caterpillars as they shrivel up and become chrysalises. Do they know what a monarch butterfly's bright wings look like? Do they have any idea of what flying and fluttering will be? We can only imagine here. We know that when we die, we rest with God, we rest in peace, we close our eyes, and he wakes us up. But if what we say every week is true, if we're not lying, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, then at the last, these bodies will be raised. What happened to Jesus on Easter Sunday will happen to you and me too. And so just as the risen Jesus could hold others and be held, just as he could speak and hear, just as he could eat and drink, just as the wounds in his hands and feet and side were no longer shameful and painful, but glorious and beautiful, so too you will hold your loved ones and be held. So too you will speak and hear, you will eat and drink. Our wounded bodies will no longer be a source of weakness and shame, but be glorious and beautiful. And that means that all the good things that we love about this life, our loved ones, our friends, the good earth, music, food, it all continues. We are made for this life, and in the resurrection, God will make a new life out of this old one, a new heaven and a new earth out of this old one, a new body for you right out of your old one. This past week, I ran across a picture of a friend of mine from seminary, kind of vaguely kept in touch with over the years, gathered with his family in a hospital bed. He's a pastor, and his lovely wife is a professor of theology. They have four small children, and she, at the age of 33 years, lay unresponsive in that hospital bed, snuggled by her children, dying of brain cancer. Earlier this year, she wrote, I have the use of only one hand. I have two brain tumors and four kids. So this may indeed be the last thing I write. So in her honor, her name is Beth, Beth's honor, I want to read you her last words about dying and about the promise of the resurrection. And you'll excuse me if I get caught up at any point. When I was first diagnosed, she wrote, at the age of 33, the same age as when Jesus died. Everybody around me was preparing for Christmas, and I prepared for radiation and chemo. And there I encountered Jesus in the garden. And as I went through the sickness and the tiredness of radiation, I encountered Jesus at the pillar. And now I encountered Jesus on his walk to the cross, helped along by countless Simons. The Jesus I am coming to know is not so much a healer or a moral teacher or a miracle worker even, but a sufferer. He came to suffer, not to show us a way out of it, but to suffer with us and eventually to triumph over suffering that never lets the suffering be forgotten. I am encountering the Jesus who is still showing us his wounds after the resurrection. I don't think Jesus will heal me. I hope he does. I hope they come up with a cure for gliomas tomorrow. 
But even if my hopes are realized, I will still die. And so I pray less for a miracle than I do for courage and for good humor and for the resurrection of my body. I pray that I am able to suffer well. I pray that I am able to die well. I pray for those I love to see the good that God is doing after I die. My life is too short to end, but it has been a good, no, a great life. I've met great people. I have a great husband and four great kids. I have seen great places. I have read great books. I've eaten lots of great meals. I have drank great wine. But most importantly, I have come to know and to love a great God. And when everything else ends, I'm going to keep knowing him. I am proud to be a member of Jesus' church. I take great consolation in the fact that his body appears on countless altars around the world every day. I am happy that I get to keep being a part of Christ's church even when I die. People are saying that they are praying for a miracle for me, but I know the miracle has already happened, and pretty soon my eternity is going to be Easter morning. Beth died in that bed with her kids by her side Wednesday night. She took comfort in the fact that on the altar, Christ's body is given for you and me again and again. Maybe her words don't convince you, or maybe you want to believe but are not sure. Well, come and see. Come and receive today our Lord's living, resurrected body given for your broken body on this altar for you, and his living, life-giving blood poured out for the forgiveness of your body. They are in the bread and the wine because there will be lots of eating and drinking in the resurrection. They are proof that your body belongs to him, that he will raise you up, and like Beth's, your eternity will be Easter morning. For God is a God not of the dead, but of the living, because to him, all of them, all of them, all of them are alive. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.